Father, we ask you that your spirit would magnify your son. In Jesus' name, amen. For you are the one we want to meet. Jesus, shine through all the praises that we sing for you. It's all for you. Here we are, here we are. Yes, it is, God. 
your face to shine on me. Oh, be gracious with the light of your countenance and give me of peace come minister tonight
Clothe yourself in light, a garment like the sun, a rain holiness, the everlasting one. All other gods can't see, the heavy ears we cannot hear, but you have made all things, you alone are to be.
Jesus, we love you. Holy Father, Holy Son, Holy Spirit. You are beautiful. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, worship team. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Let's remain standing for a moment. Let's just turn around and just greet the folks around you. Just take a minute, stretch, and say hello. And if you want the teaching notes tonight, go ahead and raise your hand up high. Wave your hand if you want the teaching notes. Most of you have them. Hands up high. Okay, let's go ahead and grab a seat. Truly, this sounds corny, but it's actually true. Truly, one of my favorite Bible teachers is teaching tonight. His name is Stuart Greaves. The Trinity, the realm of the fire of God's love. Now, Stuart, you understand, since this I am over this course that everything on this I could use in my future handouts. 100%. Okay, good. <laughs> this looks juicy. Because all that is just rephrase your stuff anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Father, I thank you for your beloved servant and the, the spirit of revelation that you have imparted in and through him over the years that just keeps increasing and increasing. And I pray for a spirit of impartation Lord, a spirit of impartation in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. All right, good evening. You guys got your notes? All right, well, let's uh, turn your Bibles with me to Isaiah chapter 33. Isaiah 33. Session three, as we're talking about intimacy with the Trinity in the context of eschatology. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about the Trinity as the realm of the fire of God's love. The Trinity as the realm of the fire of God's love. In Isaiah chapter 33, in uh, verse 14, and halfway through the verse, uh, the prophet Isaiah, he raises this question, who, who among us? shall dwell with devouring fire, and who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? And the, uh, uh, the, uh, the broader context of this passage, he's talking about, uh, about the release of God's divine judgments and his fire, but he's also talking about that in that time, that in the midst of God releasing his end time judgments, there is the experience of the fire of God that there is this invitation to, to live or to dwell, as he says, in what we're calling tonight the realm of fire. Now, when we're talking about the fire of God, it is admittedly a, a, um, an, a spiritual idea. Um, it's a mystical, if I can use that phrase, but if we were to kind of reduce it into some real immediate practical points, and we'll hit those again later, it really comes down to the five components of the love of God that we are called to experience, which we'll look in just a few moments, as well as an experiential component. And so there is the practical outworking component of the love of God, and there are five components or five dimensions to them. And there is the experiential component of the fire of God. When the fire of God touches us, and again, you know, we, um, you know, as a Holy Spirit people, we regularly ask the Lord to release his fire and whatnot. Uh, but again, you know, when we talk about the fire of God, it's not something that's just simply reduced to what we experience in a meeting, though we experience those things in a meeting, but there's some real uh, powerful components of practical love 
that gets walked out called the realm of fire. And then secondly, there is the experience of fire that we can, we can have in a meeting or we can have in the privacy of our own uh, time before the Lord in the context of the prayer room. And, the, and some of the experiential components of God's fire um, are, here's a couple of them. One, the fire of God, what it does, it actually tenderizes our heart. It, it, it tenderizes our heart. It makes our heart uh, 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 equipped to receive and to experience more of God's presence. Uh, secondly, it, it empowers our heart. It invigorates our hearts. It strengthens our heart to love. I love that prayer in Ephesians chapter 3 where Paul prays that God would strengthen our hearts, that he would strengthen us in the inner man, that Christ would dwell, that we would grasp the love of God. And what Paul essentially is praying there for is that we would experience the supernatural strength to love. Again, the, the subject of strength to love is, is a vast subject because when we think about love, in particular as it relates to the culture, it is often very much so sentiment-driven. Again, there is the experience of love, but when, but when the Scripture talks about the love of God, it is not only talking about the experience of it, it actually is talking about this, this reality where we are equipped and strengthened by the grace of God to deny oneself, to give of ourselves to others. In paragraph A, Jesus prophesied that there is coming a time of great pressure on the earth. And those days will be gripped with four predominant negative emotions. Now, Mike, he came up with this, uh, this uh, acronym called FOLD, F-O-L-D, FOLD. And FOLD actually covers these predominant negative emotions that Jesus highlights when he teaches on the subject of the end times. Uh, F stands for fear, fear. O stands for offense. L stands for lust. And D stands for deception. Fear, offense, lust, and deception. These are the four predominantly highlighted negative emotions that will manifest in the hearts of those, paragraph A again, who are, number one, disconnected from Jesus in prayer, number one, and number two, who are disconnected from God's divine narrative. When we're connected, disconnected from the Lord in intimacy, in prayer, and we're disconnected from the narrative that it makes our hearts vulnerable to these four uh, negative emotions. Now, paragraph D, the prophet Isaiah, he um, says that because of the intensity of the end time crisis, he says that youthful zeal um, or youthful resilience will not stand in that day. The pressure that is coming and that is mounting will be so intense that even youth, he says right here in Isaiah 40, verse 30, even youth, they shall faint and be weary, and the young men will stumble and fall. That even the, the hope, the vibrancy of a bright future, even the physical strength, the uh, uh, almost like the emotional tank, so to speak, because of youth, he says even that reality won't be sufficient enough in order to withstand the pressure that is coming. Now, what is interesting is that in 2020, we actually, I believe, began to see the initial emerging signs of the deterioration of youthful resilience. I say this again, in 2020, we begin to see the beginnings of these signs where youthful resilience began to deteriorate. Now, again, 2020, paragraph B, because of the impact of COVID-19, um, a larger than average amount of young adults, and so from the ages of 18 to 25, they reported signs of anxiety and depressive disorder at the rate of about 56%. And compared to adults, and so those from 25 and older, the numbers were higher among the young adults than they were among the adults. And you can see some of the statistics there. Even you shall faint and be weary. 
and young men shall utterly fall. Now, the prophet Isaiah, he continues and he actually gives us a solution to this dynamic in paragraph C. The answer Isaiah gives is that the end time church is to live lives of waiting on the Lord. Living lives of waiting on the Lord. That famous verse, Isaiah 40, verse 31. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I wish we had time to look at these verses, but really if you kind of want to go a few verses back, Isaiah 40, 29 to 31, I mean, they are absolutely amazing. You know what? I'm going to touch on it. Just, I, I can't help myself. I'm going, to, <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to do it anyway, just for a few moments here. Isaiah 40, uh, verse, uh, uh, this is absolutely amazing. Verse 28, the prophet declares, have you not known, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth. Here it is. He neither faints nor is weary. And that's how it starts. It starts with the fact that God, the uncreated, the self-sustaining, self-sufficient, uncreated God, it says that he neither faints nor grows weary. That's point number one. Point number two, verse 29, it says that he gives power to the weak. And I love this next phrase. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. I want you to catch that. He says, to those who have no might, he increases strength. So the question is this, how can you increase something that does not exist? And the reason why this is important is because, again, going back to verse 28, it says it is the creator of the ends of the earth. In other words, it is precisely the God who created something out of nothing is the one who uses his creative power to increase something in the lives of those that they don't possess. He goes on, verse 30, he says, even you shall faint and be weary, which is a direct contrast to the uncreated God of verse 28 who doesn't faint nor grows weary. Verse 31, but those who wait on the Lord, those who live lives of being before the Lord and engaging in intimate interaction with him, is that they shall mount up with wings like eagles. In other words, they will have a vibrant spirit. And look at this, it says, they shall run and not be weary, walk and not faint. They will possess in their inner man the very strength and the very might of the uncreated God of verse 28. Again, paragraph C, when we're talking about waiting on the Lord, we're talking about, in our context, the experience of entering into the Trinitarian conversation. Another way of saying waiting on the Lord is entering into this Trinitarian conversation. And the Spirit is calling the church to our inheritance. And our inheritance is this, it is to experience the love of God in the context of engaging Trinitarian fellowship. That is our inheritance. We go down to the bottom for a second, then verse uh, um, underneath paragraph F, John 17, verse 5. Amazing passage. And Jesus says, Father, glorify me with the glory that I had with you before the world. So Jesus prays before he goes to the cross. 17 verses later, verse 22, he says this, and the glory which you gave me, I've given it to them. And the glory that he's talking about is the glory that he had with his father before the foundations of the earth. In other words, he, in other words, that we are given access to enter into this Trinitarian fellowship. And in verse 24, it says, Father, I desire that they may be with me where I am. In other words, that they may be with me in this Trinitarian conversation, in this divine community. And behold my glory which you have given me. And so the life of waiting on the Lord is entering into that Trinitarian conversation. That is our inheritance. That really is our destiny as the people of God is to be swallowed up, is to be caught up in 
the Trinitarian dialogue or the divine community. Paragraph D, the, uh, the negative emotions that Jesus warned us about, so the fold, the fear, the offense, the lust, and the deception, uh, they can, in my opinion, they can really be summed up in this one phrase, the love of many growing cold. The love of many growing cold. And I think it's precisely because of the dynamic of love growing cold in the culture, love growing cold in the world, the antidote that the Lord gives us is to enter into that divine community or, in this context, the realm of the fire of God's love. It is that very place, it's living in that divine community where we find safety, where our hearts begin to get tenderized, empowered, equipped, purged, strengthened to walk in love while love around us grows cold. Now, the thing that's interesting about the love of many growing cold is when I first read this verse, I don't know, maybe 20 plus years ago, I imagined that cold love would look like these, you know, these stoic people just kind of walking around like robots. And then here we are, you know, 20 years later, and I'm going, people are more passionate than ever. <laughs> what, what am I missing here? I never knew that cold love would look this passionate. I'll say this again. I never thought that cold love would look this passionate. So how is it that love grows cold? Well, we have to go to the fundamental, one of the fundamental reality of love. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he what? Gave. It's this issue of the giving of oneself, which is the direct opposite of what is happening within the culture. 2 Timothy 3, uh, Paul makes it very clear that in the last days, he says, there'll be perilous times. And the first reason is, is because men will be lovers of self. The, the emerging of narcissism, the rise of narcissism, that is love growing cold. Where a generation is becoming increasingly abandoned to self. And it is precisely for such a time as this that the Holy Spirit is inviting us into the divine community, and it is no accident that the whole discourse of the divine community starts in John 13, which shows us that the very nature of love is that, is that, is that it's humble. It is the giving of oneself to another. In direct opposite of um, what's going on in the culture. Um, let's see here. Hmm. So I'm going to ask you a question for you to ponder because um, I've, been, um, I've been miserable with this question and, and misery lust company. <laughs> and so I'm going to bring you into my misery. And, and don't email me. Just be miserable for me, okay? That's, I'm not looking for an answer. But I'm just looking for you to be miserable with me on this. Uh, but, the, but here's the question. We've all been told that, that the most re difficult relational dynamics is three. And I find it interesting that the Trinity lives in divine community of three persons and it's perfect love. And I go, Lord, what is it about the divine community that perfect love can exist with three. That's my question. I am miserable. You're welcome. <laughs> no, but think about that. That of all the combinations, all the setups that could have existed in the Godhead, it is the most difficult relational dynamics. Because usually when there's three, somebody feels left out. The
The revelation of deep passion of humble love is what we see in, the, in, um, in John 13 to 17. The negative emotion Jesus warns about paragraph D can be summed up in the love of many growing cold and we are called to dwell with and experience the realm of fire of God's love as the only safe place to live. The only safe place to live. And when we're talking about dwelling in that place or living in that place, we really are talking about dialoguing with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's what it means to live there. That the more the Lord teaches us, and I so appreciate what Mike shared with us uh, last week. It says, you know, that we're to be patient with ourselves, right? Because it, is, it can be very daunting. There, there's a lot of information there. But the Lord is just little by little, inch by inch, pushing us forward in this dialogue. And as we're having this dialogue, we're, we're whispering these short phrases. You know, the thing that strikes me about speaking words, if, if I'm going to be honest with you, I'm asking myself, why am I not speaking more words? I want to speak more words. And one day it just hit me. The reason why I don't speak more words is because it is so insultingly simple. It, this, beloved, this is so, so simple. There's something within our hearts, at least within my heart, that wants to be able to go, I did X, Y, Z, and I accomplished X, Y, Z. The Lord goes, no, he goes, I just simply want you to say words. Thank you. Show me more. <laughs> I mean, it is that simple. It's like, really? Do you know, the thing, do you know how insulting that is? Well, think about this for a second. We get to engage with the most awesome being who offers us great, you know, power, authority, love, destiny. And he says, what I want you to do is I want you to simply speak words. You know, in Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, we know the passage. So, you know, Joshua as a military general. Moses is dead. Joshua, the military general, is about to lead the army of Israel into the promised land. I'm sure he's got his Hebrew wilderness West Point going. He's got his boot camp. He's got his special forces. He's got the swords. He's got the spears. He's got the push-ups, the calisthenics, the, 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 the aerobatics, the conditioning, everything else. And then the Lord comes to him and says, hey, I want to talk to you. He goes, okay. He goes, I'm, I'm going to give you my military strategy. Okay? He gets out his notepad. pen. He's ready to write down on the board. And here's what the Lord says. Joshua, here's what I want you to do. He goes, I want you to meditate on my word day and night, and when you do this, you'll prosper. He's like, wait, what? He goes, he goes, the strategy for you as a military general to take over the promised land is I want you speaking words to me. Oh, Lord, I'm a military general. We can wield swords. We can do push-ups. We can do special, we can do all these things. He goes, I mean, can you imagine? I mean, imagine a prophet going to the Pentagon. America has got a back up against the wall, about ready to go to war, and the word of the Lord is, all right, generals of America, here's what the Lord says to you. Speak words to God, and you will win the war. It's like, what? And when we put it in context, it is so, so, so simple. And so may the Lord give us insight into why this is so precious to him. May he give us insight of how, and, and the strength and the grace and the faith just to speak simple words. Point is, the way that we dwell with the Trinity is by speaking words. The um, Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 6 and 7, the Lord says, Set me as a seal, a seal of love upon your heart, for love is as strong as death, and jealousy is as cruel. It's, it's demanding as the grave. Uh, when he, he's talking about the love of God, the, the zeal of God, the jealousy of God. It is so all-consuming. It is stronger than the grave. In other words, it will not let go when it begins to, when it begins to touch our heart. 
It says, our, it, uh, its flames are the flames of fire, a most vehement flame, or as one translation said, or it is like the very flames of Yah, the flames of God. Many waters, instead of waters, the fears, the offense, the lust, the deception, it cannot quench love, nor can the floods drown it. The realm of the fire of God's love is the safe place for us. The Father's answer, paragraph E, is an end time witness anointed with the seal of fire. The spirit of burning, Isaiah 4, verse 4. The glory of the Trinity is expressed as fire, which Isaiah calls everlasting burnings. So I believe when he's talking about dwelling in everlasting burnings, I believe he's talking about the Trinitarian fellowship. We are invited to dwell in God's fire. In other words, where who God is and what he's about, it's on our mind. Again, I just so appreciate the, uh, Mike's five steps towards intimacy, and it's, it starts with the information. Part of the dwelling is to where we begin to fill our minds with information, with knowledge, with data points about these truths. Secondly, that we are to interact with the Trinity. We interact by speaking words to the Lord. Secondly, thirdly, we receive from God's love. We, we posture our hearts to receive from him as we interact with him. Thirdly, we release, we are called to release the fire of God. Here it is, back to God. We'll talk about that in just a moment. We are, we are called to receive God's fire and release that fire back to him, as well as releasing that fire towards one another and to the world. Let's go to page two. The name of God and the realm of fire. In my opinion, the pinnacle of the upper room discourse, the pinnacle of John 13 to 17 is John 17, verse 26, where Jesus says, I've declared to them your name. I will continue to declare it that the love that you have towards me might be in them towards me and I in them. That's the pinnacle, the, the climax of where everything is going towards in John 13 to 17 is, is that we as the people of God experience God's love for God and love God in that exact same way and experience deep union, deep agreement, deep intimacy, deep fellowship with the Lord. I believe that's the pinnacle of that. But it is related to Jesus declaring the name of God to us. The name of God in the realm of fire, paragraph two. Now, when we're talking again about the fire of God, in Deuteronomy chapter four, verse 24, the Lord says, for the Lord your God is a consuming fire. He is a jealous God. And so when the fire of God is revealed in just a moment in Exodus chapter three, it really is the, the love of God. It is the zeal of God, the, the passionate, the wholehearted commitment of God uh, uh, to himself and to his people, his radical, deep, wholehearted commitment to love. And Jesus says in John 17, verse 6, he says, I've manifested your name uh, to the men whom you've given to me out of this world. Paragraph A, Moses was the first one to experience the realm of God's fire, and it was in the context of the revealing of the divine name. Or, the realm of God's fire is connected to the knowledge of God. The discovering of who God is, his personality, uh, his power, and his purpose. Now, the name Yahweh was the name that was introduced to Moses. Uh, if if, um, if my memory doesn't fail me, he's the first one to discover God in that way. Exodus chapter 3, verse 13 to 14, you know, uh, the angel of the Lord appears to Moses in 
this bush, this burning bush that is set on fire but is not consumed. And at some point, uh, the Lord speaks to Moses. He calls him by his name. And then in verse 13, ver Moses said to God, if they say to me, who sent me? He goes, what is your name? What shall I say to them? And, and God said to Moses, I am who I am. I mean, that is such a Mufasa statement, right? It's like, it's just like, <laughs> right? It just makes, it's got that mm to it. Okay, anyway. And, uh, but yet it's so shrouded with mystery. It's like, you know, if I was Moses, I, he'd say, I am that I am. And, and, and be like, you know, Lord, usually I am is followed by, you know, something, you know? I am steward. Like, what is this I am that I am? What's going on over here? Such a powerful statement. And yet, uh, most of the theologians believe that that was the introduction of the divine name, Yahweh. And again, but it's happening in the context of the revealing of God's jealousy or his fire. Right? Deuteronomy 4.24, it is later on that God tells Moses, hey, that fire that you saw in Exodus is my jealousy. It is my deep, holy commitment to love. There's something about the revealing of the name, the divine name, that connects us with the revelation of his love. When God revealed the divine name, he also revealed, paragraph A, the last sentence of paragraph A, he also revealed himself consumed with fire, of God's zealous love. Paragraph B, the divine name Yahweh is filled with awe and mystery. And what we're gonna look at in just a few moments is that I believe that when Jesus is talking about I've declared to them your name, I believe he's pointing back to Exodus chapter three. There is a realm of fire that is associated or a realm of jealous love the most vehement flame. There's a realm of deep, wholehearted commitment and love that is associated with the name. I am that I am. God uh, speaks of God as the source, the creator, the sustainer, and the completer of all things related to human, uh, to human affairs and or creation. Let me say this again. When God tells Moses, I am that I am, he is saying, I am the source. I am the creator. I am the sustainer. And I am the one who brings into completion everything concerning the affairs of humanity and all things related to creation, I will bring everything into completion. I'm the alpha and I'm the omega. I am the beginning and I'm the end and I'm consumed with jealous love. What's interesting is in Judges chapter 13, Judges chapter 13, Manoah, who's the father of Samson, the angel of the Lord, appears to Manoah, and Manoah asks him the same question that Moses asked. He goes, hey, what's your name? And the angel says, why do you ask my name, seeing that it is wonderful? In other words, seeing that it's filled with wonder, it is filled with awe, it is filled with mystery. I am the transcendent God. And what happens is when the angel of the Lord ascends, he ascends in the flame of fire. There's the presence of fire again here in the context of the revealing or the subject matter of his name. Paragraph C, in John 17, what happens is, is we see Jesus, the greater Moses. Right? Moses is the one who had an encounter with the consuming fire and he asked uh, who he was, and he, he said, what's your name? And God reveals to, him his, reveals to him his name, and Moses began to carry the revelation of God's name in his generation. Well, Jesus is the greater Moses who will ultimately bring into fullness, the full understanding and the revelation of the name of God. And what is interesting is that in the Old Testament, 
God's name was revealed as, again, as the source and the sustainer of all things. In other words, it was revealed as, in a lot of ways, in terms of his function. Because this is what I do. I, I remember uh, a couple years ago, there was a, uh, one of the uh, students at IBU. I just taught on the judgments of God, and she, and, uh, she approached me and she said, man, she goes, that was intense. She goes, uh, man, she goes, uh, I don't know what to do. I go, what do you mean? She's like, you know, I just always thought of God like just this tender teddy bear. And I said, well, he is, but you just found out what he does for a living. <laughs> he is our father, but he is also the ruler of everything that is created. That is his job. It's like one of my professors said, he said, God is not his name. It's his job description. It's, it's what he does. And so the point is, is that he gets revealed to Moses in terms of his job description, the creator, the sustainer, the source, the completer of everything. And yes, I'm consumed with love. But then the greater Moses comes on the scene and he introduces him in familial terms. He says, he's a father. And I'm his son. And now the door just gets flung wide open that we can enter into deep, intimate fellowship with the one called Yahweh. In the New Testament, Jesus shows the name revealed as intensely personal, familial, revealed as a father and a son. The father is the I am, John 17, 26. I will reveal the I am as father and how the father loves the son that the church would love the son in the same way that the I am loves the son. Secondly, the son is the I am. John 8, 58, he says, I am. The spirit is the I am. It is the spirit of Yahweh, the spirit of the I am. The Father is the sustainer and the creator and sustainer and the completer of all things. The Son is the source and the, and the sustainer and the completer of all things. The Spirit is the source and the creator and the sustainer of all things. And they are on fire. Paragraph D, the Father and the Son and the Spirit are the everlasting burnings. It is the fellowship of the eternal flame. The Father, Revelation 4, 3, consumed with fire. He's the, he's the sardius God, completely consumed with fire. The Son of God, Ezekiel 1.27, from his waist up, he's consumed with fire. Revelation chapter 4, verse 5, the Spirit are like these seven torches that are around the throne. The whole thing is fire. Daniel 7, the throne is on fire. The wheels are on fire. There's a river of fire. Even the angels are on fire as they're standing in the presence of the fellowship of the eternal flame. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit consumed with this all-consuming love. And when we do Isaiah 40, 31, waiting on the Lord, entering into the dialogue, we are being invited into Isaiah chapter 33, verse 14, who among us can dwell with everlasting burnings? Of course, paragraph E, the primary on-ramp into the realm of fire is dialoguing with God through his word. Jeremiah 23, verse 29, the Lord said, is not my word like a fire? Luke 24, verse 31, did not our hearts burn within us? See, the, the, the realm of fire was touching them as Jesus was opening up the scriptures concerning him. As Jesus was revealing the name, their hearts were being set on fire. Their hearts were being tenderized. The hearts were being equipped. The hearts were being empowered by the realm of God's love and God's fire. A paragraph, let's go to page three. Page three, paragraph three. The, the love of God and the realm of fire. Paragraph A, the, the primary theme that Jesus speaks to his disciples in John 13 to 17, I think is the subject of God's love and God's glory. 
So the primary theme, the primary subject, is God's love and God's glory. And Jesus' main objective in these five chapters is to lead us into the revelation of God's divine love, experiencing and experiencing the glory that he possessed with his Father from before the foundations of the earth. In other words, he wants to equip us by revealing, one, the love of God and the fellowship between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit that we are invited into. You know, the, the thing that I think is true to most in, 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 in terms of the human heart is, is wanting to be a part of the inner circle. I cannot think of an inner circle more in a circle than the Trinity. And how it answers the longing of the heart to belong in a divine community. It's absolutely amazing. Our destiny is to be swallowed up into the eternal fellowship of the Godhead forever. First Corinthians 119, God is faithful. Paul says, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son. When he's talking about the fellowship of his son, he's talking about the relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 1 John 1, 4, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his son, Jesus Christ. Paragraph B, as love in the culture and in the world continues to grow cold, Understanding the Trinity as our model and intimately engaging divine, the, the, the divine community as our source will equip the heart of the church into the fullness of God's love. I just want to mention something I forgot to mention earlier, just real briefly, because we're talking about the Trinity being our model and uh, being our source. Let's see if I can find this here. Where am I? Um... John 13, it's a, a, a couple of quick thoughts real quick. So we're talking about uh, the Trinity being the model, and it's a, but it, it's onto something, okay? It's onto something. What it's onto, it's onto the church being that witness that is walking in deep and profound union with one another. And it's the same union that exists between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, number one. Number two, that the church would walk in love with one another in the exact same way that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit walk with one another in love. That is the, uh, that's the trajectory of where this is going in John 17. John 13, what Jesus gives us, he gives us what it's going to take. There's what is required of us to arrive at that destiny. And we find out tons of things in John 13, but for our context today, what we find is this issue of humble, servant-hearted love is what we find in John 13. A kind of humble love that's not natural to the human heart, yet God says it is required to arrive at the destiny of John 17. In John 13, uh, 34, he says, a new commandment I give unto you, right? We know the passage, that you love one another. And I really wish that he would just stop right there. I'm like, Jesus, it would be so much easier if you, just, if you just said love one another. I mean, the culture is filled with love one another. But Jesus completes the thought and he says that you would love one another as I have loved you. You're like, oh man. The requirement is love one another. The standard is to love as Christ has loved us. You're like, man, that's really intense. And I imagine the Lord going, you have no idea how intense that is. And it's not until John 15 verse 9 that we find out how it is that he loved us. 
And how it is that he loved us is the exact same way that the father loves him. You're like, oh, oh man, this is intense. He goes, yes, it is gonna require John 13, verse 34, John 15, 9, to arrive at John 17. In other words, what we've been asked to say yes to is completely and entirely impossible. Which is why Jesus comes on the scene in John 15. He says, you know, in John, 4, John 13, you're like, oh my gosh, this is intense. This is so, so, so intense. John 13, the requirement. John 17, the destiny. John 14 is the access. He now begins to expound to us the access that we have to God. He says, you know what? We're not gonna leave you to your own devices. You really are invited into the realm of the name, the source, the sustainer, the creator, the completer of all things to do its work in you. He shows us the access that we have to the presence of God. Chapter 15, he then begins to show us how we must engage, actively engage in that access. Because here's what he says. He says, I'm divine. My father's the vine, vine dresser. You all are the branches. We go, okay. He goes, unless you remain in me, unless you abide in me, unless you interact with me, he goes, it's impossible for you to bear fruit. Like, okay, but what's the fruit? And we'll keep on reading. He goes, the fruit is that you, that you keep my commandments. That's the fruit. We go, okay, but what's the commandment? Verse 12, that you love one another. It is impossible to do John 13, 34, which is the requirement for John 17, aside from abiding. How do we abide? Speaking those simple words. Simple words, simple phrases. My own life, I'm continually surprised what happens inside of me when I speak simple phrases and when I don't speak simple phrases. And I've experienced the positive and the negative enough to know, to be convinced, that it really is speaking the simple phrases. Father, thank you for loving your son. Show me more. And, you know, and the thing is, you know, we live in America, so in the Western world, it's all about being original and being innovative. Right? So not only is it insultingly simple to speak words, we got a guy named Mike Bickle who says, here's the phrase that I use, try those. And we're like, no, I want to be original. I want to come up with my own phrases. The Lord goes, man, he goes, I am making this thing as simple as possible. I got some dude from Midwest Kansas City to come up with a list of phrases. He goes, and try these. No, I want to do my own thing. The Lord goes, well, I'm telling you, it is that. It is insultingly simple. I want to challenge us. I don't normally talk like this. I want to challenge us. Use those phrases and see where it takes you. Well, I don't want to do No, just use to see where they take you. You'll get your own later on. Just start that way. It's okay to be a child and go, ga, ga, goo, goo, ba, ba, ah, you know, and imitate mom and dad. It's okay. We all start out by imitating mom and dad. We don't all, we don't come out of the womb as teenagers and in our 20s. <laughs> It's okay just to go through a season of imitation and see where it takes us. I really, really, really want to challenge us to do that. Some of you are spending more time trying to come up with the phrase and speaking the phrases. Okay. Back to God's love and fire and <laughs> swooning and feeling the hills are alive and the sound of music. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So paragraph B again. Uh, oh, I forgot. The, you know, so the requirement, John 13, the access, John 14 and 15, the witness in John 16, and the destination in John 17. All right. Paragraph B. And um, um, as love in the culture grows cold, 
the understanding of the Trinity as our model. John 13 and 17 shows us the model of the Trinity, of what humble love looks like. And intimately engaging the divine community, the everlasting burning is our source, will equip the heart of the church uh, uh, in the fullness of the love of God in times of great pressure. Paragraph C, John 13 to 17, I'm probably gonna end it with this. John 13 to 17, Jesus envisions, calls and equips the church to engage with God in order to fully walk out five components of the love of God that he wants us to both experience and express. Number one, we experience God's love for God. God's love for God. For instance, John 13, verse three, it says that Jesus, he, he says, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, well, if we go to John 13, verse 35, we find that the Father giving all things to his Son, according to John 3, 35, is because the Father loved his Son. And so in John 13, 35, 13 verse 3, when Jesus is thinking about how the Father, he says, knowing the Father had given all things to his hands, it's, it's Jesus knowing the love of the Father. John 15, 9, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. The understanding of God's love for God. In John 15, verse 12, uh, Jesus says that we are to, uh, he says we're to love, see here, verse 12, John 15, Verse 12, he says, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Verse 13, he immediately jumps into this. Greater love has no one than this than he laid down his life for his friends. Number one, he's saying, look, love one another. That's the commandment, number one. Number two, here's what love is. It's the laying down of your life for your friends so we understand that he's saying, look, I want you to live a life where you lay down your life for one another, number one. Number two, the thing that is incredible about this is this, is that Jesus laid down his life for his friends, namely us, but guess who else who are Jesus' friends are? It's the Father and the Spirit. Jesus laid down his life for his friends. He laid down his life for the Father and for the Son. Jesus died for God. He died that we might have eternal life, but he also died that God the Father might have us. In Revelation chapter five, he purchased men for God through his own blood. And so John 15 verse 12 when we take a closer look at it, we realize, wait a minute, it is talking about God's love for God as well, not just God's love for us and our love for one another. Number two component is God's love for us. So the first one is God's love for God. Number two is God's love for us. And we got a series of verses there. Number uh, three, it's God's love in us towards him. God's love in us towards him. We're not merely loving him with our own affection. No, it is the very impartation of God's love, the very experience of God's love that gets expressed back to God. Because remember, in the fellowship of the eternal flame, it is the fire of the son that goes towards the son, towards the father. It's the, it is the fire of the father towards the son. It's the fire of the spirit towards the father and the son. That is the only love that is to exist between the three. And you and I are invited into that dynamic to receive of that fire and express that fire back to God. One of my uh, favorite verses, and my two favorite verses in the Song of Solomon is uh, Song of Solomon 4 9. He says, You have ravished my heart, my sister, my bride, with, with one glance of your eyes. And that's so powerful. But I love Song of Solomon 6 5. When he says to her, he says, Turn your eyes away from me. 
He goes, you're too much. You are more awesome than the army of banners. He goes, I am the God of Revelation 17, where the armies of the kings of the earth, they come against me and I smite them with the breath of my mouth, but your gaze is more powerful than all the armies of the earth. And why? It's because it is the love of God in us being reflected back to him in power. And so it's God's love in us towards him. Number four, it's God's love in us towards one another. Look at those verses. Last one, uh, number five. Let's let the worship team come up. Number five, is God's love in us for a hostile world through the apostolic witness. God's love in us for a hostile world through the apostolic witness. Jesus describes dynamics of the world that will hit eschatological heights, if I can use that phrase. And in John 13 to 17, our hearts are being equipped to be an apostolic witness against a hostile world of the very love of God towards them. Paragraph D, God's love for the world through the apostolic witness is expressed by the fellowship of sufferings. Uh, Peter wanted to lay down his life. However, Jesus told him that when it comes to accessing the Godhead, only Jesus' blood could accomplish this. Yet he prophesied to Peter, but you will follow my path later on. And I believe that part of the following is the path of suffering. The end time church will enter into the divine fellowship of suffering to reach the hostile world. It's really a lot of what Mike was talking about tonight about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. That that is a token, a, a picture, a model of something that the end time church will begin to walk in as things unfold. This fellowship of suffering. There is a there's a suffering element that entered into the Trinity and we are to enter into that called the fellowship of his sufferings. The end time church will enter into that divine fellowship of suffering to reach the hostile world and call them into the divine community through the born again experience. I want to end it with this verse. I love this. First John uh, verses one and three. John says, which we have heard that which we have seen with our eyes, that which we've looked upon concerning the word of life. He says, we have seen and we have borne witness and we declared to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. In other words, he's saying, look, we're, we're preaching the gospel to you. Uh, we are, we're speaking of the good news of Jesus Christ to you. And here's why verse three, that which we've seen and heard, we declare to you that you may have fellowship with us. In other words, he says, can you imagine going to a hostile world saying, look, we are preaching Jesus to you. And they go, well, why? Because we want you to have fellowship with us. And they go, okay, but what's the fellowship? I love how this ends. He goes, the fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. This, this Trinitarian, this, this divine community that that the Lord is inviting us into beginning to experience in that more intentional way, it will be so powerful, it will so move our hearts, it will so equip our hearts that, that our message to the world is come, come into the divine community. Come into a place of belonging, humility, love, commitment, joy, peace, belonging, understanding, acceptance, come into the community. Beloved, it's not an accident that the culture is talking a lot about family and community, family and community. It's, it's the spirit of Babel, but the point of it is, is that out of Babel, God calls the people into the true and the divine community. And we're gonna be equipped to be that apostolic witness as things begin to unfold, to call people into that fellowship. Let's stand. Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for who you are. Lord, 
Thank you, Father, that we've been given access into the holiest of all, the divine community. Father, thank you that your word says that you desire to be known and understood. Jeremiah 9, 23. Father, I ask you that you would continue to give all of us in this room, in our spiritual family, Holy Spirit insight. Holy Spirit insight to know more of this divine community. In Jesus' name. Let's just take a moment and worship the Lord for a moment and uh, we'll go from there. The love that you have for Jesus Put it inside of me Burn it on my heart Like a seal, like a seal In the famines of your presence Or in the floods of persecution or in the comfort of the culture It's still real, it's still real Oh, oh, oh I just want a heart that is for
coming now, Lord. fire on you as well as the weight feel like a weight and energy of his presence on you that you just going to come to the front and also if you've just been feeling you've been in a season where it's just been um, you know a sense of heaviness we're going to pray for you as well the Lord wants to break off heaviness but he also wants to increase that sense of God's fire that's beginning to rest on some of you invite anyone that's on our team to go ahead and come up front and begin praying for
Take me to that place, Lord, to that secret place where I can be with you. You can make me like you. Wrap me in your arms. Wrap me in your arms. Wrap me in your arms. Take me to that place.
Every time we worship, we see your face. 